All right, uh, so we're going to finish up the talk section today, and then we will um, have a review tomorrow, I believe, and then the test on Monday, and then we'll be done with pharmacology, at least from me. So, Yay. right? Maybe? I don't know. Anyway. Um, any questions from stuff yesterday or the day before? I did post that video. There were some extra slides that I recorded there, so there is information. I would recommend watching it. If not, there's some really just nice jokes in there. You can go back and read it. Uh, anyway, so let's talk about envenomation. So this is not something you'll probably get many other places. Or have you covered this anywhere else? All right, so we're going to talk about it here. So um, being in Florida, being in a swamp, essentially, uh, we got a lot of critters out there that may be biting our patients. And so it's good to be familiar with them, which ones we need to really worry about, which ones we don't need to worry about so much. And so uh, first off, we're going to talk about our snakes. And snakes we need to, to think about treating here. Um, when do you think snakes or snake bites tend to be presenting to the, say, to the hospital most often. What time of year? Summertime, Summertime right? So, however, being in Florida, we're warm, relatively speaking, uh, pretty much all year round. So we can have, you know, rattlesnake bites that happen in November, um, December occasionally, but certainly during the summertime. Right now it's starting to heat up. We're getting a lot, a lot of calls uh, already. And so this is frequently one of the, the most common things during the summertime they'll take call on uh, are just snake bites, what to do with them, how they need to be managed, et cetera. So um, the common ones you're going to run into, the common venomous snakes, right? This doesn't include like your black racers and things like that that are non-venomous, but includes our copperheads. You probably won't see a ton of copperheads around this area, but certainly up in the panhandle, you're going to see more of them. You're going to find the cottonmouths, which are going to be, I'll show you pictures of these in just a second. We'll have our pygmy rattlesnakes and then our eastern diamondbacks. You know where you find the western diamondbacks? Out west, right? So we have the eastern ones. Uh, and then we have the eastern coral snake. All right, so that's actually going to be a little bit of a different uh, beast altogether, so to speak, um, because we have uh, basically our pit vipers. They're going to be your rattlesnakes and water moccasins, and then you're going to have your um, the coral snakes, right? They're kind of two different families. The venoms are very different, and we'll see how those are managed a little bit differently. Now, um, who do you think are most likely to be bitten in terms of patients? Young. Young, why young males? Why would you say that? Reckless? Maybe they're trying to impress somebody, maybe of the opposite sex, perhaps. Hey, look at this. Maybe. Who else might be frequently bitten? Hikers, yep, they're out there hiking the trails. Pet owners. pet owners, absolutely, yes. We see certainly some exotic pet owners who will be bitten by their pets. Uh, we see those uh, with some regularity. Not super common, but we see them regularly enough. Well, who else? Kids, little kids that get bitten very frequently, right? So and if you're thinking about it, where do you think the bites normally occur? To the hands, right? Because people are trying to handle them, right? So that's uh, very frequently. You have kids who are trying to pick them up. Um, you'll have, uh, say, young intoxicated males. Old intoxicated males will do the same thing. Guess what? Guys really stop maturing at around age 13. Um, and so you'll find that typically they're picking things up. They should not, and they get bitten, right? Um, if you go to other countries, um, you'll typically find where, you know, say venomous snakes or uh, you know, like cobras and things like that are. Typically the feet are going to be more often where the bites occur because people accidentally step on them and things like that. However, the bites can occur anywhere. Uh, I've had a few bites to the face before. And we know why a patient would be bit in the face by a snake. They're trying to take a selfie with it, or they're trying to give the snake a kiss, and then the snake does not like that, and the snake bites back. Um, again, this sounds hilarious, because it is, right? A lot of times these are self-inflicted. Um, people will do some very not smart things to themselves, and this is definitely one of them. Um, right, but again, we talk about the, the seven T's. This is something I use to determine my risk uh, for a patient to be bit by a snake. Seven T's include uh, being toothless. Uh, they usually drive a truck. They usually have some testosterone, usually males. There usually is tequila involved or alcohol, right? So usually people are drunk, they make bad decisions. Um, they usually have uh, some tattoos. And the higher the tattoo to tooth ratio, the more likely they are to see it. <laughs> I like to include tatas because usually they're trying to like impress the opposite sex. Uh, these are the most common things, right? So again, yes, it sounds funny, but these are the people that get bit, right? So if you go to like back to my hometown, like there's a lot of people that get bit by snakes there because they go and they pick stuff up and, and whatnot. Again, kids also are going to be the uh, the other thing that are, are most frequent there. Now, again, when you go to kids, is there a gender preference there? No, little boys and little girls can do stuff uh, at the same time. However, when you get to adults, typically men are going to be more, much more commonly bitten. If I see females, it's usually like they're gardening or something like that. They reach in behind something and they got bit by a snake, right? 
Anyway, so here's an example of the pygmy rattlesnake. I should have warned you if you have any kind of snake triggers that there's going to be some big pictures of snakes. Um, here, the pygmy rattlesnake here. Now, again, do they always have a rattle on them? Not necessarily, right? They've shed recently. They may not have the, the rattle there. Um, if you hear it, obviously, that's one thing, but, you know, still very frequently you may, you know, not hear it, and, and you'll see it first, right? Um, I'll talk about some common things that you can identify. One of these pit vipers, they have some very, um, uh, they have, their anatomy is such that you can identify them pretty easily for the most part. However, um, we're going to find that keeping a safe distance is probably going to be the best practice for a lot of these guys. Um, we have the copperheads. Again, there's actually two snakes here. As you can see, it's not like a double-ended, double-head snake or anything like that. But um, <laughs> copperheads, obviously, from the copper kind of uh, appearance there. We have the water moccasins. Why do you think we call it a cotton mouth? The white mouth. They open up their mouth and it looks very white, so those are cotton mouth. These are typically, you're going to see, these, these are uh, much more like water-based snakes. So you'll typically see these around like lakes and, and streams and things like that. Um, they tend to be a little bit more aggressive if you kind of, you kind of make them angry. Uh, but notice here that there's no rattles on them, anything like that. So it does not need to have a rattle to be a venomous snake. Certainly, you can tell by the, the nice fangs, it's, it's housed in there. And then they have the eastern diamondback. Um, you know, these are going to be much larger snakes. Obviously, you're going to see that the dose of venom administered tends to um, vary depending on when the last time the snake ate. Um, it can vary based on the size of the snake. There's a lot of different factors there determining how much venom really gets uh, injected in one of those bites there. But these guys tend to be some of the worst ones we run into in terms of the dose we need to administer. Um, copperheads, pretty wimpy for the most part. Some of those we don't even treat with anti-venom if we do think we have an actual bite. Um, the eastern diamondbacks, pygmies, uh, cotton, uh, cotton mouse, those typically are going to be a little bit more nasty from, a, from an envenomation sort of standpoint. So um, the family they fit into is called Crotalidae. Those are going to be the pit vipers, if you hear that. Um, and so basically, we call them pit vipers because they have heat sensing pits. You can see them right here on the snake. And those are going to be able to detect uh, minute changes in temperature. And that's how they basically aim so they can go bite something that hopefully is their next meal. Uh, other things you're going to find here is that when they need to have hinged fangs, so you'll see those nice big hypodermic needles that they send out whenever they open their mouth. You're going to find that they will have uh, elliptical pupils. Again, this is just applying to the pit vipers here we're talking about. So they'll have kind of the cat's eyes kind of looking pupils there. Um, they may or may not have that rattle. That's not always going to be there. Just know that. And also they have a single row of anal plates. Now, again, you may ask yourself, why in the heck would I ever need to know if the snake has a single or double row of anal plates? There are some rare occasions, right? Because people, usually when they find a, a venomous snake or they've been bitten by one, what do they do to that snake afterwards? They kill it, right? So sometimes they decapitate it. And then sometimes they'll try to bring the snake in with them for identification. And so I actually had one case where um, they only had was the, the back half of the snake. It didn't have the head, so they couldn't tell if it had, you know, a triangular shaped head, didn't tell what the pupils were and all that. But we uh, they're trying to figure out if it was a venomous uh, bite or not. And so my, my attending at the time walked in, he looks at the snake, he's like, nope, not venomous. And the attending, the ER attending was like, well, how can you tell? I was like, well, it's based on the anal plates. And he's like, you're the only person I know that can look at a snake's ass and tell me if it's poisonous or not. <laughs> But sometimes we do that, right? And again, the nice thing nowadays is that people used to bring in these snakes all the time. Um, not great because then, you know, you can find that some of the reflexes and the head will still be present even after death. So people have been bitten after the snake's dead before. Nowadays, everyone has a camera in their pocket. Just take a picture. That's all we need to see for the most part, right? Um, but things you want to find out are going to be things like, you know, the number of strikes that occurred, usually just the one bite, but there can be multiple depending on the situation. Um, look at the venom status of the snake itself. You'll find it about... You know, maybe 20-25% of these bites tend to be dry bites, which means that even though they were bitten, no venom actually got injected there. And so those are obviously going to be managed a little bit differently because they probably don't require anti-venom, as we're going to see there. And then the location of the bite is going to matter, um, you know, whether it be the feet, the hands, etc. Um, these things are going to cause a lot of swelling. It's going to cause a lot of pain. Um, and so one of the big monitoring things that we do is going to be monitoring how much swelling has occurred. And that gets difficult if the snake bite uh, bit your face, and then now your whole head's kind of swelling up, right? Um, so sometimes this can be a little bit of a therapeutic challenge or a clinical challenge, but uh, those are things you want to know. Okay. Again, here's another picture kind of showing you um, some of the identification uh, things you're going to be looking for in terms of identification. Again, they're going to have a triangle-shaped head. And these are just the pit vipers we're talking about, rattlesnakes, water moccasins, etc. Now they have the, the fangs here, elliptical pupils, and they will have the single row of anal plates here. Versus the double row, you may see if you had a uh, non-venomous snake. Okay. Here's some examples of what these bites may look like. Again, you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of necrosis. There's going to be a lot of swelling. There's going to be a lot of pain associated with this. They look really nasty when they come in. That's just how they, they look, right? So why do they do this? Well, there's all kinds of different... Um, 
chemical or different substances are being injected when you have one of these bites there, and it's going to cause um, you know degradation of the tissue. There's going to be tissue necrosis that occurs here. There's going to be pro and anticoagulants, so you end up developing um, kind of this. It almost looks like a DIC kind of thing, like a disseminate intravascular coagulopathy, almost like that, where you're going to have your platelet levels are going to be dropping, your PT, PTT are going to be elevating. It looks very similar to that, um, and then you're also going to find that even potentially there are some cardiotoxins here as well. Cardiac toxicity is not very common in these patients, but occasionally you may see that. So it's going to cause a lot of direct tissue necrosis. You're going to find um, this is going to cause your platelets definitely diminish. You may also find differences in, or changes in your hemoglobin hematocrit if they're bleeding. It doesn't happen too, too frequently there. Um, in some cases, you may have some paresthesias, some tingling associated with that. Some of that can be due to some neurotoxins that may be uh, present in, in the actual bite itself. Okay, So it's important to distinguish between the systemic and the local sort of effects here. Locally, as I mentioned, you're going to find that swelling and that ecchymosis and all that's occurring there. Systemically, though, you're going to find the blood discourage is what we're really focused on. So measuring uh, our platelet levels, monitoring that. We're going to be monitoring PT, PTT. We're also going to be looking at our fibrinogen. That's another thing that ends up getting depleted when you have one of these bites occur here. Okay, so fibrinogen is another big monitoring parameter. Again, as I mentioned, painful swelling, paresthesias, ecchymosis. Um, in some cases, and again, this is a snake I didn't mention before, but we have a what we call a canebrake rattlesnake or timber rattlesnake. Um, these are not super common here, especially this far south in Florida, but occasionally you run into them. Um, they can be really, really nasty and actually develop uh, patients develop rhabdomyolysis. That's one thing you want to watch out for. In, in terms of just toxicity overall, you're going to find the rattlesnakes tend to be the worst, followed by the water moccasins, followed by the copperheads. Like I mentioned, some copperheads don't even need treatment in uh, more minor cases there. Systemically speaking, um, again, why do you think you get fear, pain, and anxiety? Or why do you, why do you get the fear and anxiety? Because you just got bit by a snake, right? People usually get pretty anxious in those cases there. Uh, pain, obviously, just due to the, uh, the actual venom itself is going to be pretty painful, especially all the swelling and all that occurring there. I may get tachycardic, may have nausea vomiting associated with this, one thing to know. Um, renal failure, that's usually secondary to the rhabdo, but it's not very common. Um, and even in some cases, you may actually have some patients develop neurotoxicity, and this is going to be more seen with like the Mojave rattlesnake. That's typically going to be more out west um, uh, in New Mexico, Arizona, places like that. But again, the biggest thing is going to be the hematologic effects. You're going to want to be monitoring this. So your platelets are going to go down, fibrinogen is going to go down. PT, PTT are going to be elevating. Okay, so those are things you want to be watching out for. And again, you want to trend these because I need to see if the venom is being absorbed systemically, what kind of effects that's going to be, right? And a lot of it, because we don't know how much venom the snake actually injected, there's no way to tell a dose, so to speak. It's just based off of the laboratory values and looking at the actual clinical progression of the swelling and whatnot. So um, if you have a patient who presents and they say, I just got bitten by a snake, and let's say they don't even know what it was, they didn't even see it. Again, you got to make sure it's not going to be one of these venomous snakes. Um, for these, typically, you're going to watch them for at least 8 to 12 hours. Okay. Um, again, it could be a long time there in the ER. Sometimes if it's overnight, we may just admit them just for observation. Um, but you're basically looking for swelling, looking for any, uh, you know, um, that's one of the big monitoring things. You're also going to be looking at the coags, right? So PT, PTT, fibrinogen, and platelets are the big things you're monitoring for. Assuming that there is no, say, progression of swelling, there's no... Um, coagulopathies that develop after that time period is probably a dry bite, even if it was venomous in the first place, and so you can discharge a patient home safely. One other thing you have to consider, though, is about their immunizations. If they are not up to date, you want to consider getting them a tetanus booster, okay? If they're out of the time frame or whatever, you can give them a Tdap or whatever you need to do. Um, things not to do in terms of first aid. Do not put tourniquets on the patient. Anyone know why? If you put a tourniquet on, what does that do to blood flow to the area? It's going to decrease it. And that means less oxygen getting to that tissue, which is already necrosing because of all the venom. So we do not recommend putting tourniquets on. Um, occasionally, patients will freak out and they'll do it anyway. And so we have to be very careful because the other thing you see is if you release that tourniquet all at once, all that potential venom that's been sitting there pooling can be absorbed systemically all of a sudden. And we have seen some issues of uh, cardiac toxicity from that. So you have to be really careful on uh, those patients there. Also, we do not recommend uh, sucking out the venom, cutting the venom. If you look at those fangs, they're hinged, right? Or they kind of... Um, uh, <laughs> They're curved. So again, even though you're sucking maybe right where the bite happened, it's probably not actually where the venom is when it actually got injected. So because of that, we don't recommend doing that. Um, basically, the thing I tell people is that the, the best thing you can do in terms of first aid for a snake bite is to get a set of car keys so we can go to the hospital. However, one time I told some students that, and one of them goes, so you rub the car keys on the bite? And I said, oh, honey. No, no, we don't. I don't call students honey, but that time I was like, hmm. 
<laughs> but no, um, again, just get him either 911, get him to the hospital, whatever you need to do. I had one guy call the poison center and he said, hey, I was down by the river and I just got bit. Do I need to go to the hospital? I was like, yeah, you need to go to the hospital. He's like, all right, well, I'm about an hour away from my car. I was like, call 911. He's like, oh, I have to. Yes, you just got bit by water moccasin. Yes, you need to do it. Anyway, but that's a bit the biggest thing is just getting them in because, again, we need to look for the monitoring. Now, um, again, some of these are a little bit more slowly progressing depending if there's not a lot of venom, but some of them can, can see swelling of the, the affected limb two or three times normal size within minutes in, in some cases there for some very severe injections. Um, things you want to know about the patient, those one, again, check their tetanus status here. Um, ask about allergies. Uh, specifically, you want to ask about things like latex allergies. You want to ask about papaya allergies. I'll talk about why that is in just a few moments. Again, most of the patients probably have never even heard of a papaya, so it's probably not a big issue, but pineapple allergies is another thing you also want to consider as well. And then uh, additionally, have they received antivenom before? One of the biggest risk factors for getting a snake bite is, guess what? A previous snake bite. Usually they don't necessarily fix their, uh, their, uh, their behaviors that led up to that point, and so they tend to get bit more often than not. Um, so we need to know if they got antivenom recently because of the fact that you could have some uh, potential outcomes from that. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and obviously we're going to be assessing their pain, their anxiety. We can treat that. Um, typically, what kind of pain meds do you think we're going to be using for these patients? Pretty heavy duty opioids, right? This stuff is very, very painful. Again, I probably don't want to give them ibuprofen. Why might I not want to do that? Because of the bleeding risk, right? So again, typically NSAIDs are not going to be recommended here. Um, opioids are going to be uh, typically uh, used pretty, pretty, um, pretty liberally for these patients because it is quite painful, right? Um, I remember one time I, I was talking to a, a young child, probably six or seven, who got bit by a snake, and I was saying, okay, well, you know, what did it look like? He's trying to you know, describe it, and I was like, well, how long was the snake? He goes, I don't know how long the snake was. I was like, oh, well, you know, do you know why we measure snakes in inches? He goes, no, why is it? Because they got no feet. <laughs> they kicked me out of the room after that. But, <laughs> but that was after we gave him some some morphine. He's feeling much better after that bite, and so he's doing okay. Yes, sir. Did you ever bite into like a finger block? We have not used a block before. Um, it could maybe potentially be using it, but um, I. I Nah, I just go to opioids. They, they need it. All right, it's painful enough. We're just like, man, just go for it. And again, you have to worry about you know the the spreading of the venom itself because again, it will get into the lymph system and kind of start to spread up. So that's why we end up seeing that kind of progression that occurs there. So yeah, it probably wouldn't be super super effective, right? We're going to do more systemic therapy. But it's a good thought though, for sure. Yes, sir. Something silly. Would it be wise to put like a little bit of epi around the area if it's not an air like digit spills or anything? No, we're totally, we, we want oxygen flow to the tissue, right? So again, um, it's necrosing anyway by by impeding that, just like putting a tourniquet on. It's not really doing us any good at that point. And again, the thought is like, well, maybe we prevent the venom from getting more systemic. If it's going to go systemic, it's going to go systemic. Because again, it's either going through the lymph drainage and the venous drainage, it can be on the arterial side, things. So again, it's going to get, if it's going to get absorbed, it's going to get absorbed. Yeah, for sure. Um, Okay, so this is the thing you want to know is in terms of management. Now, um, we need to do what we call circum circumferential. I always have a hard time saying that. Measurements, what does that mean? This means around the limb, right? So you want to make sure you're measuring that. Typically, we like, want to make sure that you actually have two lines when you're doing that. So, for instance, if I was measuring, this is important because this is um, a point I want to make here. So you want to measure with two lines. That way, when you have your measuring tape, you put it right in here in between uh, the two lines there. The problem if you do just a single line is what? What do you think? Exactly. So if I have like two different nurses who are doing the measurements, you may get wildly different measurements. If they do one on one side, one does it on the other. If you have shift change, a different nurse comes in. Um, this makes sure we get the same accurate measurements uh, because if I see that the, the limb has now gone up in size significantly, that may lead me to decide to use more antivenom. That may be a wrong conclusion based off the measurements. So that's really important to make sure we're measuring that. We're also going to measure the leading edge, so that way we can see how far, uh, far progressive it is. Typically, if it passes a major joint, then I'm going to go ahead and administer antivenom at that point. So if the bite happens on the finger and it crosses uh, the wrist, I'm probably going to go ahead and treat it with antivenom. Or if it happens, say, to the calf and it progresses up uh, to the thigh, we're probably going to treat it at that point as well. Right. So this is what we talk about when we say progressive swelling. It's either some circumferentially or it's going to be actually progressing up uh, to uh, more than, um, uh, up the body. Anyway, um, as far as uh, hematologic monitoring, PT, INR, PTT, fibrinogen, and platelets are what we're going to be monitoring for here. Um, again, you want to get an initial set, and then you want to trend it, right? So typically every six hours is where we're going to be looking at that. If I have a patient who I suspected to have a dry bite, I get the initial set, check it again at six hours, and by that time, by the time the results come back, there's no abnormal trend. 
patient looks good and there's no swelling, you can discharge them home. Otherwise, if you start to see that the platelets are going down, fibrinogen is going down, PTINR is going up, that's the signs that, okay, there's probably some venom here causing systemic effect. We probably need to treat at this point, okay? Those are my two indications for anti-venom we're going to see is hematologic toxicity or uh, progressive swelling, as we'll see. Now, typically, um, people get concerned because the limbs get so swollen, you're worried about compartment syndrome. This is not going to be usually a surgical issue. Some people, especially if you ever let a surgeon around when they snake bite patients, they're probably going to try to do a fasciotomy. You don't want to do that. They just need more antivenom if that's going to be a concern. I've never had a patient have any um, uh, permanent neurologic sequelae from having the swelling here as long as they got proper antivenom, right? There's no surgical need uh, for vast majority of these patients. The one case I have seen it used with some use is going to be with digitotomies, where if you actually had a bite to the finger, um, because you don't have a whole lot of space there, that has been done uh, somewhat or occasionally, but again, it's pretty infrequent for the most part. And I could give more blood products. So again, I could try to reverse, um, I could try giving platelets and whatnot, but what's going to happen to those blood products when I infuse it into the patient? The venom's still there, right? It's still going to chew them up just like it did anything else. So again, that's going to be um, not super effective, usually not needed. Again, you can see here what, uh, how this patient would look after a fasciotomy. Again, that's going to be permanently scarring. We don't want to do that to the patient. We don't need to. Again, so it's not usually recommended. That's actually pretty good, and it lined up perfectly there. I didn't even mean to do that. Anywho, so what are we going to give to treat these patients? We're going to give them antivenom. This is where we have our Crofab. This is the standard sort of uh, pit viper antivenom that we have here. It's actually uh, ovine-derived, so it's coming from sheep. And it is uh, basically hyperimmunized sheep against... A couple of different snakes uh, varieties here. So we have the Western, Eastern Diamondback, the Mojave, and then the Cottonmouth. Now, if you notice here, there's no copperhead, but we can still use it to treat the copperhead envenomation. And that's the reason why is because there's enough homology between the venoms that it does cross-react. And in fact, you may actually find that this actually can be used for non U.S. snakes, in fact. So, uh, for example, when you have um, people who are collectors, I've had Mexican uh, pit vipers who there's enough homology where I actually use Crofab for that. I've had some South American snakes as well where there's enough cross-reactivity that actually worked, which is great, um, because you're going to find that typically antivenoms are going to be very specific to a certain group of snakes. And in this case here, it's just really to those North American pit vipers. Um, Anyway, so again, indications as I mentioned would be progressive swelling, any kind of coagulopathy, or if they have any kind of hemodynamic compromise, right? Um, so uh, if you get hypotensive, anything like that, that's going to be an indication to go ahead and treat at that point. Again, most often though, it's going to be the swelling or the uh, coagulopathy is what it's going to be our indication to treat. So uh, our dosing is basically, um, again, I'm not going to ask you specific um, points on dosing, but I do kind of want you to know how we're using it. And so initially, we're going to give four to six vials. Again, notice here is my dosing. I'm dosing of vials, not milligrams, not anything like that. And I'm going to infuse that over an hour. Um, how do you think I decide if I need to use four, five, or six? This is the kind of thing where if you talk to like 10 different providers, probably going to give you 10 different answers, right? So a lot of it is based off your clinical gestalt, right? It's based off of if the patient presented 15 minutes afterwards and his arm is already two times its normal size, that's a pretty bad envenomation. I'm probably going to go ahead and go with six. If it's something where it's like six hours ago and maybe starting to see the platelets start to dip, maybe I'll just use four, right? So again, a lot of it's going to be kind of, mm, I'm going to go with four. I'm going to go with five, right? So it's very dependent on the provider in terms of what the patient's actually showing you. Um, because this is an antibody that is designed to bind up that venom, um, what are some risks associated with that? Anaphylaxis, right? You worry about that. However, the nice thing here with this is because it's just the FAB portion, that's why it's CROFAB. It's not the full antibody. It's very unlikely that you'll find a true allergic reactions. However, you want to be prepared for it, right? So again, if you start to see they're complaining of rash or itching or there's they feel like they have a hard time breathing, those are all things you want to be monitoring for because there is still some risk, although it's not uh, high. Now, the reason why we ask about previous antivenom administrations is because if they've gotten this before, there is a somewhat small risk that they could have a reaction to it this time, right? They could have a sensitivity to it that's developed. So you at least want to be aware of it. You just want to know if that's a risk or not. And so we're going to go ahead and infuse that, and then we'll go ahead and uh, draw our coags one hour after to see how the coags are progressing to see if they are normalizing. And then uh, typically they'll do it for another three doses every six hours, so they get 24 hours worth of therapy. And then by then, hopefully, all the, the venom has been bound up and you're good to go, right? Now, again, we have to give it for a longer period of time because the venom is going to slowly leach out over time. So that's why you need to give repeated doses to bind up anything new that maybe have gotten systemic, okay? Um, typically, we'll try to monitor them at least 12, 24 hours afterwards, make sure they don't have any recurrent coagulopathy. And assume they do fine at that point, we send them on home. Okay, um, so typically uh, these patients may still have some residual swelling. It doesn't have to be back down to normal, um, but as long as the coagulopathy has resolved, they are generally are going to be good for discharge for the most part. 
So one thing to note here is that the crow fab will not reverse the swelling. It'll stop it from getting any worse, right? So this is really the big thing. It's not like you just administer and all of a sudden it just goes back down to normal size. That's not how it works. Um, typically, it's going to it will stop that swelling. That's why you need to continue doing those measurements. And in some cases, some rare cases, we've actually had to treat through anaphylaxis because, again, we got to do something with that venom there. And so we've done that occasionally. Um, as far as education goes, you want to tell them to follow up with their PCP so that we can get another set of labs done to make sure they don't have any uh, late presenting coagulopathy. We will... Again, let them know that the next time they have something like this occur, let them know they've gotten the antivenom before, so that way if they have a reaction, um, at least know about it. And then, uh, anyone ever heard of serum sickness? What's that? Basically, it's kind of like your body's kind of reacting to the, the antivenom over a period of time, and so it's kind of like mild flu-like symptoms. They can just take some Tylenol for it. They may have some myalgia, some aches and pains, but for the most part, um, it's pretty well tolerated from that, from that standpoint there. Um, and then again, we typically tell patients not to uh, participate in any um, you know high-contact sports or anything like that. However, if you have a little kid that gets bit in the summertime, you send them home and say, don't go outside and play, don't do anything rough, no, no rough housing, they're not going to listen to you. So just know there are increased risk for bleeding and, and bruising from that standpoint. Any questions on the pit vipers? All right, you guys good? You want to stop for lunch? Let me finish up the, the snake stuff, and then I'll let you guys go for lunch, if that's okay. Um, okay, so next up, we have our coral snakes. And so these fit into the family called Elapidae. We had Crotalidae for the pit vipers. Now we have Elapidae. These uh, snakes fall into the same family uh, as things like your cobras um, and things like that, right? So again, there's a, there's a little bit of crossover there. Um, but the ones that we worry about here in Florida are going to be the eastern coral snake. And actually right here in central Florida, this is probably where we have the highest um, number of bites that actually occur here. Usually between 50 and 80 or so bites uh, per year in Florida. Um, for the pit vipers, though, you're probably going to see more in the several hundreds that you're going to be getting, um, you know, especially in the, in the hot summer months and things like that. But these guys will still come up. Um, now, this is where you actually have that, that coloring. I'm sure most of you have probably heard this at some point in their life. Red on black, venom black, red on yellow kill a fellow, right? Um, that's particularly how we're going to be uh, noting this. So if you look here in the eastern coral snake, notice how it's red on yellow. Now, again, you have to do it in the middle of the snake. You don't want to do it at the very ends because they start to lose that coloring there, as you'll see. Um, they also have a black snout. It's another thing to note there. Um, as compared to the scarlet king snake, if you weren't uh, sure, you notice that oh, it's red on black. That's not going to have any, any venom in it, right? So it can still bite you, but it's not going to really be any big issue, okay? Um, but these guys, they don't have the big hypodermic needles, the big fangs there. So they actually have these rear hinge fangs um, that they actually have to kind of sit there and chew on you a little bit. They have to actually really work to get that venom in. And so because of that, the characteristic of the bite is going to be a little different. So if someone gets bit by a rattlesnake, it's usually one quick bite and that's it. For these guys, they have to bite and hold on to you. And if the patient said they had to pull the thing off and it sounded like Velcro, that's more indicative of an actual envenomation versus a warning strike. They just kind of bite you and they're like, oh, then it's usually not going to be an envenomation from these guys specifically, okay? So I'll give you an example of a story. So I got this guy who uh, was bitten by a coral snake. He got life flighted over to our hospital and was in the ICU. He ended up getting the antivenom. Um, he ended up developing severe toxicity. We'll talk about what that is in a second. But I was asking the guy, I was like, hey, well, you know, so what was the story? What happened? And he says, well, I was walking through the woods. And they always had this accident, right? So I'm not. <laughs> but he's like, I'm walking through the woods, and uh, I found this little fella on the ground, and I picked him up, and he bit me. I was like, okay, well, did he hold on? Did you have to pull him off? I like, no, 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 he just let it right go. So, okay, well, I didn't really sound like it's enough to really get an envenomation. This guy had a pretty legit envenomation. And so he goes, I said, well, what happened then? He's like, well, the second time I picked him up, and then he just, <laughs> well, the fellow bit me again. And I was like, oh, okay, did he hold on that time? And he said, nope, fell right off. I said, okay, so what happened next? And he goes, well, the third time is when he really got on there and really hung on. I said, okay, so he gave you two warning bites, and you still picked him up. He's like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> again, this is... Very typical story, so you'll you'll get to hear these yourself if you work in the ER. So anyway, so that's the thing. You, they have to actually hang on there. You have to actually sit there and chew on you before they actually get the, the, the actual venom in. Okay, So it's a big key difference between the, the coral snakes versus uh, what you're going to see with the, the pit vipers. Now, the venom here is mainly a neurotoxin. You're not going to find uh, a lot of progressive swelling. You're not going to find maybe some minor swelling or redness at the site, but typically they look pretty unremarkable for the most part. Um, they don't cause uh, coagulopathy. The main thing here is that they are neurotoxic, which means they're going to be working a lot like our non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers like vecuronium and rocuronium. They actually block acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction such that you develop paralysis. They'll start off with paresthesia, some tingling and numbness, but they end up getting 
this uh, more centripetal sort of spread of paralysis, and eventually, what's my biggest concern with that? The diaphragm goes out, intercostals go out, they're not gonna, they're gonna stop breathing on them. So that's the biggest concern is these patients requiring mechanical ventilation. Um, I, my research I did when I was in fellowship was on coral snake bites. We did a big retrospective review of all the coral snake bites for like 12 years or something. Uh, and we actually found that if the patient got intubated due to coral snake bite, the median time that they were on the ventilator was eight days. That's a long time to be on the ventilator, especially just from a, a coral snake bite, right? So this is why prompt treatment is gonna be really important for these patients here. So the big thing too is that these patients can have delayed a presentation, right? It can take time for the venom to really kind of make itself known. And so oftentimes we have to monitor these patients for 24 hours. It means they have to go to the ICU and get frequent neuro checks to make sure they don't have, uh, see if they have a dry bite or not. And so that can be kind of a tough sell when you're like, hey, I want to admit this patient to the ICU and say, oh, well, how's the patient doing? And you're like, they're totally fine. They're asymptomatic. It's a hard sell. But by saying, hey, these, sometimes these bites will be very late presenting. I've had some patients that did not develop symptoms until 18, 20 hours after the bite, and they still required antivenom in order to prevent this paralysis from occurring here. So just know that you got to monitor them for a while to rule out a dry bite for these patients. So um, again, systemic effects you're going to find here are going to be this kind of slurred speech, just ptosis, diplopia, because of the uh, progressive paralysis you see with that. Um, the biggest thing is going to be that respiratory paralysis. So that's the big thing I'm worried about there. And similar to the pit viper antivenom, this does not reverse the effects. It just simply stops them from getting any worse. So once the patient's intubated, they're going to be kind of on there for a while until the, the venom starts to wear off on its own. So uh, as I mentioned, the effects can be pretty prolonged depending on um, you know whether they got treatment or not. Uh, and as I mentioned, paralysis is going to be completely reversible. It just may take some time for that, right? So you may be sending the patient home with there's still some residual weakness, but that will resolve on its own. So what are we going to do for these patients? As I mentioned, if they're asymptomatic, you have to watch them for at least 24 hours, especially if you have a history where they actually had to pull the snake off. That's going to need to require some, some monitoring there. Um, no first aid is actually going to be recommended for these patients here. Again, no cutting, sucking, anything like that on the wound. Um, this is a good opportunity to see if your friends are really your friends or not, to say, can you suck out the venom? If they say yes, then you know they're true friends, right? Um, otherwise, that's not going to be very effective for stopping that venom, right? Um, and so don't delay any kind of medical attention. Make sure you get them in for monitoring as soon as possible. Once they're in, you can check for tetanus status. You can check for any allergies here. Um, again, check for previous bites or any, any kind of anti-venom uh, administration here. And then obviously you're gonna be treating them for the pain and anxiety. This isn't nearly as painful as you would see with a, uh, a pit viper bite, but again, some of those paresthesias can be kind of bothersome. They could be very anxious. So we wanna go ahead and treat for that. Um, none of these bites, as long as you clean the wounds, are gonna require antibiotics, which is kind of a nice thing. Um, very rarely do these ever get infected. Usually it's gonna be a lot of skin flora and things like that um, that we end up uh, treating for. And then again, as mentioned, frequent neuro checks every 15 minutes at first just to see if they're going to have any kind of uh, changes there, and that will prompt us to go ahead and treat with the antivenom at that point. So, what do we have? We have the Eastern coral snake antivenom here is a North American coral snake. Now, this one is very specific to the coral snakes, um, uh, to the eastern coral snakes here. It works for the Texas ones as well, but basically anything outside of the U.S., it's not going to work for, right? Uh, so these are very specific to the eastern coral snakes. Um, it's actually no longer produced. We actually don't actively produce it right now. And so the problem is, is that we had all this drug that was actually expiring. And so we were like, well, what do we do? We still got these coral snake bites we need to treat. And do you think this is like a really big moneymaker? No, you get like 50 bites a year. Like, you know, no drug company really has that big of an incentive to the shareholders to actually like produce this stuff. Now they're starting to work on, on getting it back up, and we actually have some other foreign products we could potentially use. Um, but the FDA would actually come through every year, and they say, okay, we're going to update our lots. Uh, we're going to say, okay, this drug is still active. They check it every year, and they will extend it out. So we're using technically expired drugs, but it's still good uh, for our patients based off that testing. Just to further show you that usually expiration dates are usually pretty bunk for most of this stuff, but um, that's, that's what we have to deal with. Anyway, the other big difference here with the CROFAB, that was specifically the FAB portion from an ovine source. Not a lot of risk for anaphylaxis. It's still there, but it's low risk. Versus here, you're going to find that these are full equine antibodies. Again, our bodies just don't like horses. And so we tend to have a lot of reactions here. It's much more likely to see anaphylaxis, especially if they're getting a repeat dose due to a second bite. They're probably going to be getting uh, some degree of anaphylaxis uh, associated with that. Initially, we do, do three to five vials, depending on how they respond. And notice here, it's just a single time dose. We don't have to continue repeating that because it's a longer half-life because it's the full <coughs> antibody. Um, but sometimes what we'll do is actually try to do a skin test beforehand. We'll do like a one to 10 dilution, uh, inject it subcutaneously. And if I see a reaction, then we know, okay, well, okay, we have a reaction here. We're going to have to treat through that. So we got to keep our Benadryl ready, our Epi, uh, corticosteroids. You might pre-treat corticosteroids and Benadryl beforehand just to 
prevent a reaction, but that's usually what we're going to have to do there. Um, and again, they're more likely to see serum sickness associated with this because it is that full antibody, much more likely to have those flu-like symptoms for several days to a week afterwards. So any questions on that? Okay, so let's break. We'll go to lunch, and we'll come back at 1230. All right, let us finish up. Do more miscellaneous envenomations. Uh, any questions from the first half? Nothing at all. Everyone's feeling pretty good about their snakes. So if you had to tell me how to identify a pit viper, what might you say? You have elliptical pupils, right? What else? Triangular shaped head, right? Single row of anal plates, again. Don't want to be that close if you don't have to, but, okay. What else? If they have giant fangs, also a pretty good sign they're venomous, right? It's some obvious ones. Do they have to have a rattle? No. Usually don't. Um, yeah, another thing I forgot to, to mention, uh, you know, the old saying, you know, red on yellow, kill a fellow. I like to say, uh, red on yellow, run the hell away. Red on black, run the hell away. Just, just stay away from them, and you can't get into trouble. You just can't get in. It's easy. Anywho, uh, moving into caterpillars, and you're thinking, well, like caterpillars, what, what, what's so bad about caterpillars? Anyone know? The hairs, yeah, the hairs are actually really, really pretty bad. Um, and actually, I, I mention this because um, these are way more painful than what you'd actually expect, even based on um, how the actual wounds themselves are going to look. But the four main uh, categories of caterpillars we have here are going to be our saddleback, which you can tell why it's called that. Huh? No, yeah, it looks like someone photoshopped a little... Little poncho on the <laughs> indigenous to Mexico. No, um, next we have the the pus caterpillar. These are fairly common. I see these uh, with some regularity. Uh, you have the eye moth, and then finally you have the hag caterpillar. I don't know who named it, but they must have been have like a really bad day that day, and like I don't know. But regardless, the reason why we care about this is because they are they're hairy, right? And those hairs are potentially able to, to pierce the skin, and they carry toxins on them, right? They have these spicules and spines, essentially, uh, and they have this, uh, not only the toxins, but the actual mechanical irritation of piercing the skin is what is so painful with these. Um, and really, the hallmark of these is that pain is out of proportion to what the actual wound looks like. It's not going to look like much of anything, maybe a little red, maybe a little swollen, but it's going to be extremely painful. I had one patient who came in, uh, he was probably like 14, 15, um, after getting stung by a caterpillar. And his mom was like, I don't even know why we're here. He is just faking. He is crying. I don't know what in the world's the matter with him. And we're like, no, he's actually in that much pain. She's like, oh, she felt kind of bad about it. It's acquired you know, two doses of morphine just to even take the edge off on it. But um, anyway, so another term for this, if you ever hear of lepidopterism, is uh, basically the caterpillar sting when you have this. So typically the pain is going to be the biggest presenting uh, sign and symptom. Again, a little bit of swelling, maybe some tangling, but for the most part, just the pain is going to be the most predominant thing there. Actually, you can have vomiting induced by the pain. In some cases, there can be so severe, so it's important to note that. <clears throat> Also, think about if you have any kind of like eye exposure, any kind of throat exposure. Again, maybe someone tried to eat one of these, who knows, or if you're like rubbing your eyes or something. That's how you can see some of these kind of atypical sort of uh, exposures there. So be aware of that. And then allergic reactions are always possible, but pretty uncommon. <clears throat> As far as decontamination goes, this is important for this because you want to eliminate further exposure here. Oftentimes, it's really hard to even see the hairs when they're actually in the skin. And so very frequently, what we'll do is actually use uh, some sort of adhesive. Duct tape works really great for this. Um, just apply it to wherever the sting actually occurred and pull that back, and that should be able to get most of the hairs that are out of there. You can do that a few times uh, in order to eliminate further exposure. And just wash it off with soap and water just in terms of wound care. Um, uh, for the, the symptoms, you can try to use antihistamines. It can help out if there's any kind of like itching or um, swelling associated with that and really pain management is going to be the big component here so apply ice to it that can help out uh, insets can be useful but in a lot of cases opioids are needed as i mentioned it took two full doses of morphine just to take the edge off for that one patient um, because it was so painful for him so just be aware of that maybe some zofran they're starting to get excuse me nauseous um, but really the um the opioids are really going to be a big thing to help out with that uh, i may need to send them home with something probably some insets or uh, tylenol to help you know for the next 24 hours or so but then for the most part it's pretty uh, limited right <clears throat> okay next up we have spider envenomations now which spiders are we worried about clinically in florida black widows and brown recluses I will tell you, brown recluses are not very common, but we'll talk about what they get uh, mistaken for all the time. But anyway, so these are the two most common things you're going to be running into. Again, how do you identify a widow? 
You always look for that hourglass sort of marking on the admin there. That is just for the black widow, though. Right? Different varieties, which we'll show you in just a second. Um, we also have the brown recluse, also known as the fiddleback spider. You can see here, um, or here's sort of the fiddle sort of pattern on the abdomen there. Again, you probably don't want them to get that close in order to actually examine that, but that is what is reported. Um, and so these are the two most common things. Now, other spiders are certainly going to be venomous. However, they oftentimes don't have the actual fangs to pierce the human skin. And so because of that, they're not really of concern for our purposes, right? These are the two big ones that cause um, yeah, actual issues for, for humans. <clears throat> So again, um, the actual envenomations can be pretty difficult to determine. A lot of times people say they got stung by a spider or got bitten by a spider, but they oftentimes don't have any sort of uh, evidence to show that, right? They either don't see it or it's, you know, they're just assuming they got bit, bit by a spider when that actually may not have been the case. Oftentimes, and again, brown recluses get blamed for way more uh, envenomations than they actually cause because a lot of times people will come up with an abscess and they'll say, oh my gosh, I got bitten by a brown recluse. And that's really not the case. Unless you have like a MRSA spider going around biting people on the butt or something. Um, but not super common, right? So if you have the spider to actually identify, that can be useful, but that is going to be far and away not the most common thing. And then again, this is a propagation of misinformation saying that, oh yeah, I had a brown recluse bite last year and it looked like this, and then it just kind of gets propagated on. Now, it's not to say that they can't occur in Florida. They certainly do. Um, they don't typically live here for most of the state. Uh, however, you can have hitchhikers who go uh, different places and can make some uh, make nests here and there. Um, black widows are probably going to be a little bit more commonly uh, seen since they are much more indigenous here. <clears throat> Anyway, um, four species of spider that's native to Florida. We're going to see you have here the southern black widow. Again, notice how that doesn't have that nice hourglass sort of shape on the abdomen. Um, so in those cases, you can't necessarily use that as your only identifying feature here. However, the toxicity is going to be identical, and so that's going to be very um, pretty uh, pretty unique to the black widow. So we're going to see what that looks like in just a second here. We have uh, red widows, brown widows, etc. Um, most often, the females are responsible for the bite. The guys are usually a little bit smaller, and they're not really able to pierce the skin. So the female bites are what's more frequent. Um, and you're going to see that uh, it's very common. They'll make kind of erratic webs in areas um, like garages and sheds and, and things like that. And so usually when people are out cleaning these areas out or they're going in for, you know, to, to find something, they'll get bit occasionally. So um, actually on a milligram per milligram basis, these spiders are much more um, venomous than uh, the actual pit vipers are in terms of toxicity. However, they're much smaller, so they don't inject much venom into the patients there. So typically you're going to find um, that these are painful, but they're not going to be as um, significant in terms of toxicity as you would see with like a pit viper. Um, basically, the main toxin we have here is called alpha latrotoxin. And so initially you're going to get the pain associated with the bite. You may see two little fang marks uh, potentially on... Um, on the, wherever the bite site is. And then usually you're gonna see not a whole lot else with the wound. This is another case where you're gonna have pain out of proportion to what the actual wound looks like. They are gonna complain of a lot, a lot of pain because what that alpha latrotoxin is doing is opening up all these cation channels. Calcium flows into the cell and that causes the, the muscle cells to contract and cause a lot of cramping. So you're gonna have this muscular contractions causing a lot of cramping and pain associated with that. <clears throat> Not only that, we can have some release of acetylcholine and norepinephrine and that will lead to a few other side effects we're gonna look at in just a moment here. You can term, just like we have lepidopterism for caterpillar stings, here we have lactrodectism for a black widow or some sort of widow uh, envenomation here. Um, as I mentioned, within 30, to two, 30 minutes to two hours or so, pain should uh, definitely be kind of coming on. And about three or four hours or so, you're going to see this really painful cramping and fasciculations associated with that calcium influx. Typically, it'll start kind of out at the periphery and then kind of spread centripetally. And in some cases, especially like in um, small infants that might have been uh, bitten, it can actually cause like a board-like rigidity. Right, and again, it's going to be pretty uh, pronounced. So, you know, it's the, the extremes of age typically are going to be um, more severely affected by these bites than others, uh, and this is going to be important. We're talking about management in just a moment. Typically, you're going to see hypertension, and a lot of that makes sense based off that norepinephrine release. So, you can expect to see the blood pressure to go up. You should expect to see tachycardia. That's kind of interesting due to that acetylcholine release. You can actually find a regional diaphoresis. So you may have a patient who's only sweating, say, on the affected limb and not anywhere else um, due to the effect on the muscarinic receptors there causing diaphoresis. Um, Nausea vomit can be seen with this. And then very rarely, and again, usually this would be in the very uh, extremes of age, you may see respiratory arrest, but that would be very, very uncommon, probably like in a small baby that got bit. Um, and again, those cases are, are pretty far and few in between. <clears throat> Anyway, treatment uh, is mainly going to be supportive for the most part. Again, good wound carriage, wash it off with soap and water. Um, consider tetanus prophylaxis if they're not up to date. And then we'll apply analgesia as needed. Now, some people have gotten some use out of giving IV calcium 
tends to provide sort of a transient sort of benefit to help with the pain. However, um, it's going to be transient, right? It's going to go away fairly quickly. So we like to use opioids for these patients as well. If they're having significant cramping, we could even use something like a muscle relaxant like diazepam or something to help kind of relax those muscles up and, and uh, kind of relieve pain from that standpoint as well. Okay. There is an antivenom available, and this is something that I've actually only seen one case of it being used uh, in person, but basically we had a, an infant that was bitten uh, that was developing severe hypertension, uh, and so we got the, um, we were able to get the venom, antivenom on hand. We are actually able to apply it to the patient there, and I was able to recover that pretty, pretty quickly, which is great. Um, but again, unless you have a very old, very young patient who's severely symptomatic or someone who's pregnant, you're probably not going to use this antivenom. It's going to be actually pretty hard to find for the most part since it's such a rare case you would actually need it. But it's another one that's an equine antibody. And so again, it's going to be one of those things that's going to be a very big risk for anaphylaxis. And so you want to make sure you have those medications available uh, to treat that if you need to. Okay. You do 24, 48 hours or so, patients should be kind of back to normal from that same point. Here's a non-venomous pig, if you're ever curious. Okay, uh, next we have the brown recluse. So this is uh, Loxicelles reclusa. And so, as I mentioned, um, not typically indigenous to Florida, maybe small pockets here and there, but for the most part, um, these are not going to be super common, right? maybe in the panhandle, some areas there. Um, typically, you're going to find that they are reclusive by nature. So oftentimes, they're not trying to go out there and, and bite people on purpose for the most part. But they will um, usually have like defensive bites if you're maybe reaching in to, to grab something and, and you're able to invade his nest there. Um, but again, bleeding for a lot more bites than it actually causes. However, the wounds it does cause when it actually happens are pretty severe, they're pretty um, dramatic when, when you see it. Basically, uh, their venom contains this thing called uh, syngomyelinase D and also hyaluronidase. What does hyaluronidase do? Anyone know? Yeah, it breaks down uh, basically the sub uh, subcutaneous connective tissue. Uh, it will start to break that down, right? We actually use um, hyaluronidase uh, therapeutically sometimes if we were trying to um, give IV fluids subcutaneously. Uh, I've done that occasionally. But anyway, so it has these two, and it's going to basically cause a lot of tissue necrosis here. And they call it a red, white, and blue lesion, where basically you're going to have kind of a red sort of necrotic core, uh, kind of this bullseye sort of feature here. And then outside of that, you're going to have kind of a blanched area, kind of white uh, area around the wound, and then kind of a bluish sort of area uh, outside of that. So you can see um, here is an example of a, a brown recluse bite. Um, some people try doing things like maybe excising part of it. They find that it doesn't really help that much. It just causes the wound to spread out even further from there. So there's not a whole lot you can do with these, but you know, providing good pain management and good wound care for those patients there. Very rarely do we get systemic envenomation. It's called loxocellism. Um, that can develop things like fevers and myalgias. You can develop things like intravascular hemolysis. And again, this is more commonly seen in the very young. So if you ever have um, like a two-year-old or something like that that was bitten by one, that's where you're more likely to see things like the hemolysis and the coagulopathies that can develop there. But usually for most adults, if you see one, it's just going to be basically that wound that happens there. Um, and again, it's going to be pretty slow healing for the most part, but that kind of necrotic ulcer right there in the middle. Treatment mainly just going to be focused on supportive care, going to help with the, the, the wound care there, update the tetanus if you need to, obviously. And actually, there's a drug here called Dapsone, which you don't use too, too frequently, um, but it's thought to actually help reduce some of the severity of necrotic ulcers. And sometimes we've seen that used in, in infants who maybe have been bitten uh, before. Unfortunately, we don't really have any antivenom available for this. There's not really a whole lot you can do from that standpoint. Theoretically, some people have tried hyperbaric oxygen in order to try to help with that. And is anyone familiar with hyperbaric oxygen? Who's that? It's the opposite of hypobaric. It is. Uh, basically, uh, we will put you into a giant uh, tin can uh, and we'll increase the pressure to about two and a half to three times atmosphere, uh, normal atmosphere pressure. Uh, normally, you're going to see it used a lot for like diving injuries and things like that. Uh, but wound care is starting to be another really big uh, area where that's getting a lot of use. And in fact, um, uh, it can help to decrease wound healing time and things like that. It's been pretty effective for it. So people you know, postulated that, well, this might work for brown recluse bites as well. So some people have tried that. Um, Again, I'm not going to get to a big hyperbaric talk because, again, that's not really my expertise, but uh, it's been used uh, occasionally there. We, I most often would recommend hyperbaric oxygen for um, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, if ever, as I actually mentioned in the lecture from the extra stuff I reported yesterday. Anyway, as I mentioned, though, excising the bite is not going to be recommended because it tends to, you can't really get all of that single myelinase and whatnot, so it's just going to continue spreading out from there. So really just good supportive care, make sure the wound's going to heal slowly on its own, just try to prevent any kind of secondary infections. All right, moving on to marine envenomations. So what kind of stuff do you think this is going to cover? Jellyfish. What about peanut butter fish? <laughs> My kids are going to be in for just the worst time when they're... 
they're in teenagers. Um, right, so we're talking about the family Nidaria, and, and they kind of all fit into the same category. So we talk about like Portuguese man o' war, box jellyfish, uh, sea nettles, all those different things, kind of fit into the same category here. And the thing that links them all together is they have these nematocysts here, where basically you can see an example of, a, say, a, a, a nematocyst in kind of the trigger, like kind of the ready-to-go sort of state, the loaded state, versus when it is going to be fired off. And so you have these barbs that will then be sent out, and that will then release components that cause a lot of the pain and irritation, itching, and things like that you're going to see associated with these, right? Um, there's a lot of different species that are out there. We'll talk about some of the ones that are more kind of clinically important for Florida, but we'll talk about some other kind of notable ones as well, um, especially like in places like Australia, where everything is there trying to kill you. Um, they also have some pretty nasty jellyfish too, uh, as the case may be. Anyway, so we have these nematocysts, and they get discharged by lots of different things. Lots of different triggers can do this. So it can either be pressure, such as if you get like a uh, jellyfish tentacle on your leg, that can be enough of a pressure to cause them to fire off. Osmotic changes. This will be important. We talk about that in just a few moments. And then also things like chemicals, uh, anything changing the osmolarity or the pH is enough to, to fire these off. They tend to be pretty sensitive. So just some examples. Um, here we have the cubozoa, which are not true jellyfish, but these include things like your box jellyfish and the urukanji. So here's the box jellyfish and the urukanji. These are really notable because they kind of uh, have a unique sort of toxicity, which we'll talk about. Most often you're not going to find these here, but you'll definitely find them over in places like Australia potentially. Uh, also, you have the hydrozoa. These are going to be much more um, common here. And actually, the Portuguese man o' war, which you have a picture of here, is seen pretty commonly here in Florida. So you'll find these most often times uh, in the ocean surrounding uh, uh, Florida. We also have things like the blue bottle uh, jellyfish and things like that. In fact, these tentacles can be quite long, even if you're in the 100 feet in some cases here. Next, we have things like the sea nettles and, and lion's manes, and then even uh, the anemones fall into this category as well, which is why you guys ever watch like Finding Nemo, like, you know, the clownfish are able to protect themselves, but other stuff doesn't like it because it likes to sting them. It's the same kind of nematocyst there um, that you can see there with that. Okay, so what happens here? Uh, basically, the, the different toxins that these are going to be releasing are going to cause uh, potentially uh, dermal necrosis. Uh, they're going to cause hemolysis in some rare cases if you were to have like a lot of it being injected all at once. Uh, for the most part, it's really the local reactions of what we're going to be seeing more frequently. Occasionally, you can even see things like cardiovascular collapse. You can see things like nerve conduction being affected here, um, and even possibility for having some allergic reactions. So again, something to keep in mind. Um, we'll talk about the urkanji and how they cause catecholamine release, and now they actually have a little bit different presentation than some of these other ones. So typically, you'll find that a uh, few of the stings are really going to cause systemic exposures. Again, the extremes of age are typically more likely to see this, um, but for the most part, you're going to find that there's a lot of severe pain associated with these. Again, you can see how uh, how you can see the, the tentacle marks here. So again, it's typically right where the, the actual tentacles were lying. You see all the where the nematocysts were firing right there on the skin. Um, a lot of pain, this erythema, erythematous linear rash. And then systemically, you may see some things like nausea, vomiting, maybe some, some uh, anxiety associated with that. But for the most part, you're usually lacking a lot of systemic effects. Um, now, the kind of notable ones include things like box jellyfish. So again, if you're, say celebrating graduating from PA school and he said, I'm going to go to Australia and go to the Great Barrier Reef and go hang out there for a while. Um, who cares about the student loans? Who needs it? Uh, <laughs> you may be stung by a box jellyfish. What's interesting is they have nets that actually try to prevent jellyfish from getting closer to where people are, are swimming. But uh, actually, some of these are so small, they can actually get through those nets in, in some cases there. Um, but what they can actually cause is things like paralysis. They can cause things like syncope. And so a lot of people who get stung by this and they actually never make it out of the water. So can, they can try to be start to make it ashore, but then they start to have this paralysis set in uh, and they end up drowning from, in that standpoint. Um, if they do make it ashore, then you start to get some care. You can see things like pulmonary edema. You can see like renal failure happen here. Um, and again, kids tend to be the more vulnerable patients here. Right? The extremes of age are going to be the big ones that are going to be affected by this. The urkanji, it's a little bit different sort of effect because they cause a lot of release of catecholamines. You're going to see things like palpitations, diaphoresis, tachycardia, hypertension is going to be associated with this as well, which can be pretty severe. And of course, that's going to be treated just the same as you would with anything else, right? So you can give them something like a beta blocker or a vasodilator or something like that to help out with it. What's also interesting is some of the effects it causes, like an impending sense of doom. You guys probably have that, probably like, right? By like 8.25 on Monday morning, you probably start to feel that a little bit. Um, you may have been stung by an urkanji jellyfish. I can't rule it out, right? <laughs> Um, also, you can see like severe back spasm and things like that could be uh, associated with this as well. So maybe some like muscle relaxants may be useful to, to help out with that. Obviously, giving like an anxiolytic like a uh, benzo can help out with the kind of uh, anxiety and, and back spasms. 
So looking at the Portuguese man of war, like I mentioned, these are much more commonly seen off the coast of Florida. Um, you're going to find uh, very severe pain associated with these. You can have tissue necrosis leading to bullet and things like that forming. Um, rarely we see the systemic symptoms, but occasionally you see things like renal failure, cardiovascular shock, et cetera, happen here. Again, that's going to be far and away uh, the less common sort of interactions. But if you have a small kid or something got stung, this could be a possibility. Uh, another notable thing here is going to be the sea bather's eruption. These are actually these larvae, and this is kind of interesting because it's not normally um, on first contact is where you get exposure to these, but the larvae can actually get into um, your, your bathing suit, right? So your bikinis or your um, uh, briefs or whatever it happens to be, um, and you'll find that uh, the next time you put that same bathing suit on, they tend to, uh, and you get back into the water, they'll then kind of cause this reaction to occur here. So if you notice, it's kind of right where exactly the, the actual bathing suit was laying, and that's typically where you'll see that. So um, areas where you're making kind of like more tight contacts, like around elastic bands and things like that, typically where you see those sea bathers eruptions um, coming up there. Again, you're going to find that these are going to be uh, fairly painful, kind of itchy to the patient, but, you know, normal uh, antihistamines and maybe some topical hydrocortisone is going to be typically uh, sufficient to, in order to manage those. So um, looking at how to actually manage uh, these jellyfish stings here, what you're going to find is that, um, you know, what was kind of the, the common, like the folk, the old, old uh, folk wives sort of uh, therapy. You pee on it, right? I, I mean, again, you can test your friendships to see if <laughs> someone would, would pee on you for for therapy's sake, but uh, it's not usually recommended. The thing is, is I, I mentioned that changes in pH, osmolarity, and things like that can cause an amount of cyst to fire. So potentially, based on what substance you're using, can actually make it worse, right? So again, if I were to, say, pee onto someone's leg who had a jellyfish tentacle on, it can actually make it worse, cause more stinging to occur there. So again, normally don't recommend urine. Normally don't recommend ethanol here. The best thing to use is just seawater, right? Because again, that's what the, they're normally sitting in anyway. So if you're still at the beach, you can have them um, use uh, seawater and usually something like a um, like a credit card or something flat and, and something to kind of just scrape it off, right? So you're not having to get your fingers exposed trying to pull the, the tentacles off. Um, if they weren't still at the beach, you could use things like shaving cream or something that acts as kind of like a lubricant and can help to kind of get those off as well. Um, those tend to be the most common things we, we do with that. Again, most people are not going to show up to the ER for this sort of thing, but it is something you at least want to be able to. To, to educate on in case someone's about to head out to the beach or something. Um, in some cases, vinegar might actually help. I think it's probably where a lot of people are thinking, oh, maybe urinal will help too. But this is only in certain um, certain species of jellyfish, and I actually would not recommend it for Florida, mainly because the Portuguese man of war is the most common thing, and that actually is not going to be very useful for that. Um, there are some products out there, some commercial products. This one called Stingos, which has um, aluminum sulfate and a surfactant, and that is designed to help prevent the nematocysts from firing while also helping you to uh, act as a lubricant to get rid of uh, the tentacles off of there. Okay, so that's usually the most common thing you'll see with that. And again, just say Visa, just... Something's hard and flat to try to get those, uh, scrape off those tentacles. <clears throat> Um, there actually is an antivenom for the box jellyfish because it is so clinically you know, devastating. Potentially, there is an antidote uh, for that. However, again, this, you're only going to find that out in Australia, uh, but it is also a sheep-derived sort of product there. Um, in order to really help out with mortality, but it can be a useful thing, especially if they're developing any kind of coma, arrhythmia, anything like that. And then for the, the hypertension, you can always use something like verapamil, magnesium, that could also be useful for helping the hypertension, tachycardia. Okay, and then we have our fish we're we'll talking about here. And so this is going to include things like your stingrays. It's going to include things like your spiny sort of fish, like your stonefish and your uh, sea lions and their lionfish and things like that, right? So um, typically stingrays are going to be firing off when they actually get uh, stepped upon, right? So again, um, normally they're going to have a barb that will then be uh, sent out and actually come in. So people usually when they get stung, it'll be basically on the, on the leg, um, now, again, there's kind of a trauma component to that in addition to the toxic component. That's what we're mainly going to focus on here. Um, but what's kind of the most famous death of stingrays? Steve Irwin, unfortunately, right? But again, that was mainly due to the trauma associated with that, not necessarily the poison that was in, injected along with it. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then the spiny fish, um, who do you think typically get stung by these? Usually collectors, uh, more often than not. So you have people who are um, collecting these for their aquariums, and they end up getting stung uh, by some of these uh, spines here. And you find these a lot, especially off in the Gulf and in the Florida Keys. Um, and we usually, most calls are going to be lionfish most, most typically, because, again, it's usually it's collectors who are getting stung. Okay, so what's going to see? Uh, what are you going to see in terms of pathophysiology? Well, the stingrays, they release all kinds of things, like there's some amino acids, there's serotonin, there's phosphodesterase inhibitors. What that does is it tends to cause uh, vasoconstrictions. So they get hypertensive. 
you get bradycardic, and you can develop seizures along with this kind of cardiovascular collapse. Again, most often times you're going to be dealing with the more traumatic component of the actual sting than you would be necessarily the venomous component, but there could be cases where they tend to be a little bit more sensitive to that, like I mentioned with kids. In terms of the spiny fish, you're going to find they have multiple spines kind of surrounding them, and any of them are going to contain various toxins. So you have things like the stonus toxin, which can actually form a hole in the membranes of cells. It can cause hemolysis. You see things like this veruca toxin, which can actually block cardiac calcium channels. So you can end up seeing arrhythmias from that. And you have this uh, trichnilocin, which actually increases acetylcholine or catecholamine release and also calcium release. So again, you can see things like hypertension, tachycardia, same with that. So again, a variety of toxins all within the same uh, spine can cause a, a whole host of different issues. So as I mentioned, stepping on the body of a stringer will cause that reflex, and that's the most common situation you're going to run into that. People that maybe didn't see it in the ocean, they step on it and it stings them. Um, as I mentioned, you'll see kind of a local edema and cyanosis that develops there, uh, and then you'll start to develop some tissue necrosis along with some of that, uh, do all that, um, uh, the different components there in, in the actual venom itself. Um, rarely do you see some of the more systemic manifestations like fasciculations and dysrhythmias, but it is a possibility there. Okay. Uh, on the flip side, you're going to have the stonefish are going to be causing uh, very immediate pain. And you're going to typically see that uh, you'll have this uh, wound cyanosis and edema that will develop initially. And the wound healing is actually going to be pretty slow with these uh, for whatever reason. And then more systemically, you can see things like the headache, hypertension, seizures, and whatnot. And again, it's related to uh, those various toxins that are releasing all this uh, catecholamine and whatnot. How do we manage these? Um, typically, we do like to get radiographs uh, for these to look for any kind of foreign bodies because, again, it can be either a reservoir for more uh, venom to be kind of sitting there. And also, it's going to impair wound healing, so you want to get rid of those if need be. Um, as I mentioned, the stingray, stingray wounds uh, may even require surgery depending on how traumatic it was, right? So, again, these can be fatal in, in some rare cases there. Um, you'll update their tetanus. And the other thing we can actually do is apply hot water to the area. Why do you think we do that? I actually help with denaturing the proteins there, right? So if you can start to break down the proteins by applying hot, and usually you get as hot as you can tolerate it, um, water on the area, and that will help to start to break down those proteins, and that will uh, eliminate a lot of the pain and some of the other effects you can see from that. So that's one thing we'll try. And then just, you know, do some uh, analgesia there uh, if need be. Um, you know, try insets first. That's not working. Opioids may be necessary as well. Um, there's a stonefish antivenom, but this is not commonly uh, used. And again, it would be maybe in cases where um, maybe if you worked in an aquarium or somewhere like that where you may be at high risk, they may have some that's available potentially. Um, and again, usually the dosing is going to be based on the number of stings that actually occurred there because uh, there's actual a good conversion between the number of units in the, uh, uh, the antivenom versus the milligrams of venom that's been actually injected there. But just remember, anytime you have these antibodies here, you can have some serum sickness associated with that afterwards. And that's pretty much it for toxicology. In terms, I mean, that's not all of toxicology, right? There's a lot of other stuff out there I could teach. The whole curriculum just on this, but I won't bore you with all that stuff. Uh, any questions about anything we covered or anything from yesterday? The myriad topics. Worst case scenario, what do you do if you have a toxic patient? The patient's been envenomated or poisoned that shows up and you're like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, call, you. call. I'm not going to give you my number like Dr. Nicholson did. <laughs> Who are you going to call? <laughs> not the Ghostbusters. <laughs> Easy layup. Who are you going to call? Poison control? Poison centers? At what number? 1-800-222-1222. Fantastic. Always keep that number in mind. Put it in your phones if you need to. Because, uh, again, it's free experts on the phone anytime, day or night, 365 days a year. We're always there, right? Anyway, let's um, see if there's any questions on the board. And that's actually it for our, uh, for our whole farm curriculum. That's it for the test. So we're going to do a review tomorrow. Uh, and then you guys will be done with the farm. That's pretty exciting. It's a major milestone. You can say... The worst class of my life is now behind me. <laughs> Maybe you won't say that. I don't know. I can't say it for sure. Um, all right. Any questions, though? If not, I will see if I can find Professor Gerke and see if he wants to start early. I imagine he does, as do you. So at least take a fiver. If not, we'll see where he's at. Thanks. Yes.